Yeah, can you hear me better? Can, can you hear me better? 
Hello? Yes. Okay. Okay. Oh, that's Iman Shekha. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I was trying to figure out. Who you were. Um, so this description actually is still very apt today, except for seeing it in uh, more preterm infants, and we sort of tend not to use the term low birth weight very much. Interestingly, too, in this paper, there's a figure of what she thought or they thought at the time. And it's interesting because uh, it's, some, of, some of this still holds good today, but we know a bit more about GI uh, development and GI physiology. But basically, decreased gut per perfusion stands at the top, okay. And at that time, congenital heart disease was a predominant cause. Um, umbilical arterial catheter, and I was actually thinking back to this because we don't really now think of umbilical arterial catheter as playing a major role. But in those days, we always kept, or we were always supposed to keep our umbilical arterial catheter uh, below the celiac axis, where the celiac axis comes off. Comes off at L2, renals come off at L3, L3, L4. Uh, and we were supposed to be keeping the catheter at um, L3, L4. Now, of course, we've moved from the, and as a result of the literature, to having low lines to high lines. So now, of course, we keep our umbilical arterial catheter much higher. I don't know that I totally agree with that, but anyway, that's what the literature says, and it doesn't care what I say. Um, anyway, so decreased perfusion, decreased cellular, cellular metabolism, and then they had this concept that there was a layer uh, of mucus coating the surface of the GI tract. Uh, they knew that there was a problem in relation to uh, immature enteric immunity. The work that Jane Pitt did was mainly with uh, rats, okay? And it, basically the bottom line is rats, baby rats that were fed formula, they died, okay? Baby rats that were fed breast milk, uh, lived, okay? So that is where the concept of breast milk being protective against necrotizing enterocolitis, that is where that arose. And she published on that, I think in 1978. And it was following that, that in Winnipeg, we developed a, a breast milk bank and it, a donor milk bank. And it was donor, it wasn't really a bank, donors, we recruited donors um, and uh, fresh breast milk was fed to our preterm infants, the very preterm infants in the NICU. Um, we did not pasteurize the milk, which would not um, pass uh, standards now. Uh, the milk was cultured when it came in. Uh, if the mum was group B, if the milk uh, grew any group B strep, strep or if there was staph aureus greater than a 10 to whatever, I can't remember, um, then uh, that milk could not, could not be used. Um, and we were, we were obsessive about how the milk was collected. We were obsessive about the containers it was in because the macrophages uh, tend to stick to plastic, but not glass. So it was always collected in glass containers. Then of course we move on to the eighties and in the eighties um, uh, HIV came along. And so therefore uh, we could no longer um, use donors uh, and certainly we would never have thought of using unpasteurized milk but we wouldn't we, we the donor milk program that we had sort of fell by the wayside and of course now uh, there are donor milk banks using pasteurized milk all across the well not all across the country but uh, in different provinces in different countries so that is essentially uh, the 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 real real old history uh, of necrotizing enterocolitis. So moving on to 1978, people were getting a bit more interested in necrotizing enterocolitis and Bell developed his classification and it has three stages or the original classification had three stages. Um, and he developed it to assess the severity, to guide the treatment and to compare management. And note that these criteria were not meant to be diagnostic criteria. In 1986, 
his criteria were expanded to six stages and included radiologic findings. And I'm not going to go through this, okay, because actually it's a bit mind boggling. And I don't know anyone who actually thinks about uh, Bell's, Bell's modified staging in detail. It's either ingrained in our mind. We know the, we know the um, different intestinal signs, um, but actually um, the sensitivity and specificity of most of them is not that great. Um, and so we sort of, um, pay some attention to them. I guess rectal bleeding, we do pay more attention to absent bowel sounds, um, abdominal cellulitis, uh, abdominal discoloration. Uh, and of course the, the, the radiologic signs were expanded uh, quite significantly. And note, I say radiologic signs, which mean uh, then and actually still now uh, applies to um, x-rays. Uh, so nothing then about intestinal ultrasound, and in fact, ultrasound for the diagnosis of congenital heart disease was only around since about 1981. So now people have not been too happy with um, how necrotizing enterocolitis is defined by Bell's criteria. So now in addition to Bell's classification, we have six more classifications for defining and categorizing and how to diagnose uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. We have the Vermont Oxford classification, the CDC, the UK, the two of three rule, the Stanford Next score. And more recently, uh, there has been developed an international neonatal consortium, which is trying to come up with, well, has sort of come up with uh, how, to, how to classify neck. Now, I mean, how to classify neck in order to define is it neck or is it not neck? The fact that there are so many classifications means, to my mind, there's a lot of confusion in actually defining what is neck and what is not neck. In a survey that was done in UK of I think it was 45 units, 57% of them stated that they were still using uh, Bell's original, Bell's modified uh, classification. Uh, looking at the differences between uh, the classifications that have been developed, UK Vaughan and CDC, they don't include any systemic signs. They all include various intestinal signs like abdominal tenderness, blood in the stools, etc. And they all include radiologic signs. They use the word radiologic signs, but they don't actually specify anything about intestinal ultrasound. It may be mentioned in some of them, but they don't actually specify anything much about intestinal ultrasound. Um, and again, in this UK survey, 44% uh, uh, of units across the UK, uh, they never use uh, intestinal ultrasound. So intestinal ultrasound, and well, I'll digress slightly for a minute. I mean, it's been around for some time. It was championed by Daneman in Toronto, who's a radiologist. Uh, it has not got much traction from neonatal units across the country um, or across the North America, and obviously not in UK, but I'll leave the discussion on intestinal ultrasound to Yasser et al. Um, how do we classify it? How do we determine in our CNN reports what is neck and what is not neck? I'm not going to go through uh, how it, how, the details of this, but just to let you know that Shana, our data abstractor, she, if you look at the, um, the grid area on the left, that's what she fills in on the database. And if you look on the right, you will see how she's supposed to decide what she puts and where, it, where she puts it. Probably um, there is pretty clear um, separation between uh, spontaneous intestinal perforation and between uh, what is considered necrotized stage two or greater necrotizing enterocolitis. But having said that, um, I think in here, uh, there is the high potential for cases of uh, cow's milk pro or uh, foreign protein enterocolitis to be mixed in with what is reported uh, as neck. Um, so the data, let me see, 
uh, okay, before I go on to the data, um, I just want to mention about inter-observer inter agreement uh, between neonatologists. And this was a paper that Dr. Rehan, who was a fellow with us and myself and some of the other, other radiologists here, we published in 1994. And we um, used the CAPA uh, statistic to uh, ascertain the inter-observer agreement. A CAPA value of greater than 0.6 is considered very good. Greater than 0.4 is acceptable. And you'll notice uh, when you look at the radiologic signs that we looked at, and we looked at 40 abdominal x-rays actually uh, under standardized conditions. Um, you'll see that none of the kappa values are greater than 0.4. So when we talk about um, uh, intestinal x-ray being a sort of, I would say, the major criteria for the diagnosis, not, not only is it not specific for neck, but I mean, if you have two neonatologists or a neonatologist and a fellow, or if you have, if you're looking at it on a computer with uh, with, uh, it, it's difficult to ascertain, is this truly neck or is it not truly neck? So another pitch for why we shouldn't be relying too much on x-rays, but we need to do x-rays. Um, so what about, um, what about, what is the incidence of neck as reported in the, on the CNN database uh, from the 31 NICUs that participate in the Canadian Neonatal Network? What is the neck incidence, um, which is probably mixed in with uh, foreign protein um, and allergy, but anyway. Um, so if we look on the left, uh, no, I want to look in the right first. Okay, yes. these, have, these have moved. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, so on the right, and I thank Deepak for doing these run charts, um, you can see that the central line for neck or the median is 8% across the country. Our central line or median is about, which is the, the figure on the left, is about 7.76 or 7.5%. 7 um, so remember that our site actually only contributes at most 50 babies less than 29 weeks to CNN annually, and at least um, 31 during 35 during the COVID times. Uh, the, the network actually, uh, they have uh, about 1,500 babies annually contributing. Um, so basically, it is stated that the neck uh, incidence varies. I can't say that we can claim to be significantly better than uh, the Canadian sites. Uh, but at least our median is uh, is not higher, and that's as much as I'll say. This is a grade two and above. Grade two and above, yeah, stage two and above. Okay, so moving to what the international consortium. So I'm trying to paint a picture of the difficulties with classification for diagnosing neck. Um, so if we look at what the international consortium has come up with, um, and I think that was Kaplan's paper, uh, they, uh, they have developed what they consider to be standardized data standards, which should be kept by every site. Um, and they are pretty reasonable. They're not uh, detailed uh, very much. And the thing that bothers me with this, again, this is, what year is this, 2023? They're proposing radiologic signs, radiograph, or ultrasound. Again, no detailed specifications about uh, what should be looked at in intestinal ultrasound. Okay. Um, I think um, this classification is reasonable, could be developed further. Um, at our site um, and certainly uh, with um, more information about intestinal ultrasound. I have no shares in ultrasound. Okay. Um, so moving on, why have we not, why are we not doing better? And as I, I told Ismail, before I retire or before I die, 
I'd like us to, I'd like us to have solved necrotizing enterocolitis. We may never solve necrotizing enterocolitis, but I'd really like to um, try and have better uh, clarification <clears throat> and discrimination uh, as to what we're really talking about when we're talking about necrotizing enterocolitis. Because if you say a baby's got neck, you go follow one treatment path. If you say a baby's got foreign protein enterocolitis, you will follow another path. And if you follow the wrong path, uh, then it may be detrimental to the health of that baby. So we really need to try and discriminate clearly and know what we're talking about. Um, I'm not going to um, I'm not going to go over this because this basically um, is an infographic that's been put forward by um, uh, Bilal Al Shed in uh, in uh, Calgary, and basically it goes into strategies uh, and what we should be doing to prevent necrotizing enterocolitis. And I will draw attention, but I'm not going to go into it. We have the bundles here for preventing neck, preventing BPD, blah, blah, blah. Um, our bundles have not been renew, reviewed in detail since, nine, uh, since 2015. Um, and really, we need to be reviewing all of them. We need to be reviewing and updating uh, the bundle for necrotizing enterocolitis. And this is what uh, Dr. Al Shait in, in Calgary has been doing. Uh, and he's developed this really nice infographic, which again, we all will have slightly different views about some of the things in the infographic. Um, I, so I'm going to go back. Yes, I'm going to go back to this slide. So since since um, 2000, there have been uh, no no. In the last five years, 2017 to 2022, there have been more than 2,000 publications on PubMed <clears throat> on necrotizing enterocolitis. Just plugged in necrotizing enterocolitis newborn. I mean, how do they expect people to? Uh, determine which are the worthwhile publications. And so, I mean, and if you look at the exponential rise in publications over the years, um, this may tell you a lot about the publication in industry, the need for people to publish or perish, as they used to say. Uh, and one needs to be very discriminating in what one decides to uh, pay attention to in the literature. <clears throat> One thing I have not touched on is we now know a, quite a bit more about gut development and uh, the intestinal uh, microbiome. I've not touched on that because that is a totally different uh, topic, as is probiotics as a preventive strategy. And we could probably spend a long time talking about uh, many more things, but really today, I wanted to concentrate on, uh, <clears throat> on, on um, the classification. So, oh, I had two, anyway. Okay, I had, I, does anyone know what a stomachion is? Uh, uh, because if you don't, I didn't know actually until recently. Um, it's the oldest puzzle known to man. It was developed by Archimedes. Um, it consists of or comprises 14 pieces um, and when you separate them all out, it's extremely difficult to put them back uh, to this. Um, a mathematician has um, figured that there are 536 ways of putting these 14 pieces together um, to this. Um, I, I actually, the story behind this is my daughter brought me, brought me this in, in the summer and because they had been to Sicily and there's a lot about Archimedes in, in Sicily. Uh, this puzzle is extremely difficult to put together. Um, I've succeeded once. I haven't tried very often. I've succeeded once. And uh, you can buy it on Amazon if you want. <laughs> and it's, it's quite entertaining. Um, and see, um, we could have a competition like Yasser's quiz, uh, how many different ways. ways you can put it together. Anyway, that's my part of the presentation. I'm going to hand it over to uh, to Ismail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor.
So, uh, yeah, now we will just discuss first as kind of case index, uh, which we had in our unit. And I think most of us, we know about it without mentioning the name of the baby. So the mom was a mom with a lot of morbid issues uh, from morbid obesity, asthma, bicuspid, or testicular hypertension, poorly controlled gestational diabetes, which was also poorly controlled. She was a 36 year old, with a two para zero, serologies were negative, GBS was unknown. The mom was being followed by the fetal assessment unit because the baby was IUGR and there was some, I mean, abnormal doublers, especially in the last uh, two weeks of following her, which showed some uh, intermittently initially absent in the astral flow of the umbilicus, umbilical artery and there was some cerebralization. The mom received antenatal steroid uh, completed antenatal steroids before the delivery by one week almost. And there was a unitology consultation that was done at the age of gestational age of 30 weeks. One of the things that was already clear in that consultation that the mom was not planning to breastfeed the baby, but she was agreeable with planning to pump, uh, which was a, an obstacle in the case of this baby. On the left side, actually, I just tried to summarize what we call the Sentinel event review, which we have for five categories in our unit, one of them for mortalities, for uh, I think the necrotizing intercolitis, for LGAN, and so on. So uh, the, the one in blue color are positive things, that she completed the antenatal steroids. There was some advocacy from our side about breastfeeding and the breast milk, but I mean, there was some problem with the mother's attitude herself. And uh, uh, we, we, I mean, we advocated for donor breast milk as an alternative. Uh, I wrote in red because I'm not pretty sure whether to what extent after the delivery, the counseling about the early expression and the pumping was done. So the baby was born as a female baby uh, by cesarean section, as we said, with it because the Dobblers were, were worse at the age of 31 uh, weeks gestational age. Upguards were good, first in five minutes. The umbilical uh, cord gases, we can say they are very good. The baby required due to respiratory distress uh, being supported by CPAP without giving any bless and did not start any antibiotics. There was no risks as it was in the cesarean section. Uh, there was a new VC inserted. It was first low lying, but then it was pushed forward and fixed that position as shown in the X-ray. The baby had low blood sugar one value, received D10W and started on the TF5, AT, started on MEF. So as risk factors, if we say about this baby for developing neck, we had the IUGR prematurity and the mother's medical and medication history. I don't know whether they played a role in, in, in the uh, sickness of this baby later on in developing the neck. But one of the things which was so clear that this baby received only daughter breast milk until the age of three days or four days, received one time about four milliliter from the mother's milk after starting the protocol feeding. So for the blood gas, the initial blood gas, um, CPAP, while the baby on CPAP, it was venous, and it's shown here, the initial the CPC blood work that was done. Uh, so the first honeymoon days, honeymoon days, was with the CPAP being weaned off to nasal prongs by the age of almost six days, received, as I mentioned, only donor breast milk. The first skin skin was by the day four, and as mentioned, the only one don uh, mother's own milk was by the day four. <clears throat> protocol feeding was advancing well. There was some routine blood work up done while the baby was on a TPN, uh, which is shown here also. This is the X-ray, I mean, I think by before removal of the CPAP, uh, which showed also that the UVC is a little bit deep. On the left side, we can say we have positive things that no formula was given. I mean, we followed the protocol. There was no variation about advancing feeding. We used the donor breast milk as an alternative and uh, uh, everything was okay from that perspective. On day seven of life, the baby uh, started the HMF and received only one dose or, or one uh, time of feeding so, uh, uh, su supplemented with the HMF at the interval feed of 87 milliliter per kg per day, which according to our uh, policy is good. At 8 p.m. the baby developed uh, blood is too. There was no other science. The baby was still just like uh, uh, a room air. Uh, and the 
and anal fissure was determined as a source of that bleed. The plan or the, I mean, what we did that time that we stopped the HMF, skipped one feeding and then continued by midnight almost, uh, started, restarted the feeding again, but without the HMF. In the morning, the baby had another blood in the stool and started to be lethargy. Abdomen started to be distended. At that time, an X-ray, which is on the side is seen, <clears throat> and it was interpreted as there is suspicious area of pneumatosis intestinalis. Uh, and at, at the same time, in the next couple of hours, the baby was decided to be MBO, and there was a blood workup that was done, showed like platelets, which is trending down to 92 CRP34. Blood cultures were taken, and vancomycin gentamicin started. Uh, uh, and the abdomen examination development, I just, it was the first distension, the, the decreased bowel sounds, absence by 11 a.m., and there was, it was very loopy by the evening. Actually, uh, at that point of time, I mean, there was a blood gas that showed uh, uh, some acidosis. Uh, uh, so that's why I added as, as a risk factor, and if we can go back, there was some acidosis in the previous uh, TCO, I mean, like, uh, uh, blood tests that were done. So this baby was started, uh, done the x-ray again, showed that kind of pneumatosis intestinalis again, and this is a uh, lateral decubitus x-ray, but there's no portal venous gas, no other signs actually uh, uh, supporting that. So those are the gases that were done at 11 a.m. The baby was because became a little bit worse but still breathing normally, abdominal distended, started on a CPAP plus six for almost two hours, and then intubated to conventional ventilation and started working up. During this progress, after intubation, uh, the baby had an X-ray, which was still showing the monomatosis and stenalis. Actually, in the official report, not, nobody mentioned about this small bubble, but Immediately after that, there was an intestinal ultrasound that was done by Hanifi. Uh, my ultrasound was before intuition. But actually, in you, oh, okay. Because according to documentation, no, yeah, okay, no, no. okay. I, okay. They were preparing for intubation. Ah, same Meanwhile, time. I was okay. making an intestinal ultrasound, and then yeah. I okay. expressed the report to intuition. So the images of the ultrasound that was done, this is the first image Hanifi chose to show us, I don't know if it's clear for you. Okay, you can see some uh, uh, the video again? Yeah. Oh, just a minute. Yeah, there's a few problems here. Yeah. And this one. So it shows some signs of. It's extensive, uh, you know, some, uh, portal gas. And you need to, to see. Speak up so that we can hear. Yeah, you need to uh, have significant portal venous gas to be seen in the x ray. Mild cases like this, or even moderate portal venous gas, will, will be missed by x ray. Yeah. It should be extensive. And ultrasound is very sensitive. Even few bubbles can be seen as, well, as detected here in this ultrasound. Uh, there is one um, area is a little bit more intense. Okay. I don't know if it's here. Here. Oh, it might be just a uh, bottom side. Bottom side, you can Here, see. this yeah, one? Yeah, those, those areas. Those areas are more intense. And uh, might be visible on the x ray. That, uh, that one, I don't That know. bubble, which yeah. is just at that end. Yeah, that could be. All right, yeah. yeah. So okay. that, that could be the one that you. So yeah, when did it? Was it was actually a, like a little bit big bubble. Yeah, exactly. Was, uh, this is another image. I don't know if you want to comment on it. Okay, so you can see uh, here, you can see there is the arrow. Oh, okay, this. Yes. Oh. Okay, you can see here, if you move uh, this one, in this area, you can see the bubbles are moving through the intestinal the wall to the upside. So oh, just, just one more time. Yeah, see? yeah it's dynamic. I've never yeah. seen the bubbles moving in the wall. 
Yeah, cool. this is very dra dramatic uh, ultrasound feature. Like as I never seen also, the bowels are moving through the wall to the uh, upside. So, yeah. yeah, it's moving towards the liver. I mean, yeah. towards the mortal system, it's moving, getting its way towards the liver. Yeah. That's why that's why the the, the yeah. source of the mortal venous gaze just escaped the bowels from the solar wall. And here uh, also you can see in this area. The, the, the air bubbles through the intestinal wall is very close to the liver. Mm, yeah, it's very nice. Yeah. So it is visible there because you can see, you cannot see the lumen. There is nothing in the lumen, just air. Yeah. Uh, just and yeah. then there is only bowel wall, and you can see everything on the bowel wall. Okay. Um, uh, this no, is the column. This one I'm pointing to. I think it's the elon should be at the column. The column is a oh. yeah, that's high for your column. So like the yeah. <laughs> pressure is a little bit lower. Yeah. Okay. So that's by this is out. Okay. Yeah. And then there is no peristalsis. Because in the wall, I can see that there's a thickness in the in the, <laughs> the right side, a, a little bit thin on the on the. Is there right like another loop? A different. Uh... Yeah. Not. Yeah. This loop. Yeah, this one I'm talking about, this variability in the thickness of the exactly, wall. Yes, exactly. yeah. So this part here, there's no signature, the wall is thick and really skinny. Here's the doctor. Yeah. I think this is the area of lack of perfusion you were pointing to, yeah? Yeah, there was a tiny perfusion. So yeah. in this area, there was no perfusion. Yeah, what Here. you see is just a fat. Yeah, fat is dispersed, but fat. now this is the image, which is. Yeah, at the end, and yeah. the color track, I think there's no good perfusion. Okay. Yeah, but, but here. The other side, there is perfusion. Yeah, yeah. similar. Yeah. 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 yeah, like the zebra or not? <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be zebra mm. and most probably a loop of jejunum here. Yeah. Because it's uh, parallel to the, the like here of the jejunum. So yeah. there is no normal as well. Mm. So based on that, uh, we continued with the management with antibiotics and the baby was an MPO. And this one was by maybe after a few hours, just two, three hours, which showed clearly the portal uh, venous gas. Uh, yeah, yeah. The baby, I mean, was hemodynamically unstable, started with, I mean, a lot of support for the vascular system. Here's the trend of the blood pressure, which was by after insertion of the arterial line. Baby received hydrocortisone dose, although I mean, like the cortisol and, um, level was acceptable above 1000, I remember, or something like this. Then uh, received bolus of thermos line back during the blood cell transfusion because the hemoglobin dropped to 85. Started on dopamine almost like by 9 p.m. and kept on this. There was a TNE that was done and showed some pulmonary hypertension, but also um, there might be some suggestion of. Uh, of uh, lack of volume, so another bolus was given, and the recommendation was to start norepinephrine and wean dopamine. Uh, the baby kept holding throughout the night till the next day. The pediatric surgery, I mean, uh, I mean, they opened the baby, and there was a big line inserted. The UVC was removed. Uh, the laparotomy showed like the whole intestine was white. Well, I mean, with no good perfusion, not compatible with fluid life. And the decision was with, to withdraw the care and agreement with the family. If I conclude the risk factors, I mean, there might be a lot, but this baby is already like in the background, IUGR prematurity with mother's medical history, the lack of a mother's own milk. I mean, the other the presence of acidosis. Uh, I, I mean, these things I added, like this two hours of CPAP, did it do anything in the theory of the bacterial translocation? Uh, I don't know, but anyway. The baby was uh, in a dramatic catastrophic development. So that was the the case. If you'd like to share your screen, welcome. Any question? Well done. You discussed so far. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Comments or questions? Both. Both. Well, the, the, so the comments, like when I went over this case, it, it actually independently and then with Ismail, um, 
the one thing, what, well, the one or two things struck me, but one thing was we didn't seem to have been paying too much attention to the fact that the total CO2 was 14, okay? And that was, um, I think, a couple of days. Prior Five days or three days. Yes. So, so then, I mean, and we don't have any blood gases. So obviously this baby was well, but a total CO2 of 14 is on the low side. So you wonder, could it be a metabolic acidosis? Should a blood gas have been done at that point? And could things have been picked up earlier? That yes, one, yeah. Well, that's one hypothesis. The other thing is this baby was eight days old, uh, six days old, when the baby developed bloody stool. Seven, Seven. Yeah, I mean, like, by the night of the sixth day of life, it started the first blood stool. So it was six days? Almost. Yeah, almost completed the six, six days. days. So, um, and, and I, I read the nurse's notes. The nurse's notes said moderate amount of blood, uh, and it was acid determined that this baby had two anal fissures. Yeah. Now, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a baby at eight days of, six days of age having two anal fissures and particularly uh, having a um, um, moderate amount of blood. <coughs> so I think uh, the index of suspicion, and this is basically for, for the fellows, you know, that you really need to, to think I mean, is this a bit unusual? Should I have been doing anything, anything more? And to put the baby uh, hold one feed, and I think overnight there was more blood in the stool, certainly by the morning. They mentioned by the early morning. Yeah, and so there was a there was a delay of probably eight and post twelve, or four, about sixteen hours between doing the workup for net. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. and a baby with net, I mean. I mean, the mortality is high. You cannot, if you suspect it, you cannot afford to do it. So that's all I'm going to say. Yeah, wonderful. I just, uh, like, uh, add to what you said, the, the suspicion should be high, and some, like, uh, the lower count that you might consider, which is not really harmful, and it's really easy. Now we have more person that can, they can do ultrasound. If we are assuming that the X-ray in our situation is really misleading, and might actually relying on x-rays sometimes might cause harm because you might keep in view on certain soft antibiotics. But at least the CBC CRP uh, or blood, plus blood gas, uh, maybe skip one feeding. If there is an available person to go after sound, that would be very helpful. If not, probably x-ray might be the solution at the time until have someone else, even if you keep in view for two or three uh, uh, feeds until someone in the morning uh, with ultrasound, can do ultrasound, and then if the ultrasound is normal, CRP is reassuring, then you can start feeding yeah. without even a start of antibiotics. Yeah, the leave anti like antibiotics might not be the the main issue here, but early diagnosis. If you delay antibiotics for three, four hours, is not that big issue because uh, we are not really sure about the typical rule of antibiotics in treating neck mm. until now. So we start the antibiotics because it is in a lot of cases association with infection. Um, and we have really ischemic gut and there's a lot of flora and pathogenic bacteria that might co contribute to the process of forcing neck. But we don't know exactly, uh, especially when we have negative culture, uh, how long we should give an antibiotics and what's the real rule of antibiotics. And uh, might be even in some cases harmful, more than helpful. Okay, so do you have a question? Comment. Um, I have two questions. Yeah, for to, 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 uh, for, for everybody. <laughs> okay. For the first question, just for my understanding, uh, for this baby having uh, been diagnosed with neck per se. Yeah, just speak, speak a little bit louder and maybe uh, I'll lose a little bit. For this baby having been diagnosed with neck or yeah. the term neck, is neck an umbrella for all the subclassifications of neck? In, in this case, the baby had some sort of hypoxic ischemic event of the intestinal. Uh, or the intestines. So is this classified as neck or is it classified as uh, hypoxic ischemic intestinal injury in this case? If, uh, if you're talking about how this baby is going to end up in the CNN database, uh, it will, this yeah. baby will end up as a stage two plus neck. Okay. Right. okay? Yeah. Because they don't specify anything about any other etiologies. Uh, do you want to comment? 
Yes, you are probably talking about the bottle shape and bottle shapes yes. and then and then laying in used in using factors. So yeah, absolutely you're right. Probably the management will not be too much different. But this infant had a higher risk of um, ischemic insult. Mm -hmm. And also the date of onset is more consistent with ischemia. And when I, I will describe in my presentation the categories, like the, my it's Probably a professor that may be expert opinion about classification. It's not really worldwide adopted yet, but it is classification about the pathogenesis, uh, and one of them is ischemia, and also the clinical classification, and also one of them is uh, the typical gut injury, which is really induced by ischemia, it could be by congenital heart, cystic heart, or or ventricular uh, outflow tract obstruction. Uh, could be also spontaneous, spontaneous and cyber frustration is type of local ischemia, ischemic injury. And that's that's why uh, SEP happened early in, in, uh, during the first week or so, or first 10 days. Typically, because there is a like, very local part of the intestine exposed to significant ischemia or stress, a very significant ischemic stress that could be induced uh, in a lot of cases by the renal ischemia or could be induced by drugs. And we'll discuss that during my presentation. There's a few drugs to keep in mind, and they are really risky to cause this issue. Just, just to add a little bit, um, and unfortunately, I didn't send you uh, the papers that I, I did review them. Oh, you did review them. Okay, because no, I, I, re I really think, um, and Nico probably hasn't, I really think the chapter in um, Chandler's book, um, I think that um, underlies. Um, how little and how much more we need to know about uh, the gut development, angiogen and angiogenesis, etc. But that will come out probably in the next five to ten years, hopefully. Yeah. Yes, uh, honey. Why these make in premature babies happening around 30 to like 31, 32 weeks? Yeah, you mean the, the development of neck? Yeah, like a classical, like classically, is happening around the Let is me No, actually, what I saw in the literature, actually, I think <coughs> there's no strong. It's common say, even in the papers, Dr. Zeshia sent to us, it's just, there's like one sentence without referencing that the peak is at 31, 32 weeks. My belief it's related to the percentage of prematurity, which is more common to have 25, 24 weeks, 26 weeks, or 28, 29, 30 weeks. My, my belief, like, and I think it's, it's a window. So the cases we have witnessed, we are witness, I mean, I'm just with the short experience uh, years, it's just like one year and a half. But as I saw, we had, we had a lot of cases, 26 and 27 and 28, and many of the cases happening at the postnatal age of 13, 14 days. Mm -hmm. I think it's a misconception because I told Dr. Yasser and Dr. Sesha, I reviewed almost 28 cases in the last two years, which happened here in San Bonifis. What I saw, and it's just a window, and many cases, like those who are 25 and 26 weeks, they had it at 27, 28 weeks. They, some of them had it at 31, 32 weeks. But when you draw the, the graph, it will show you the peak at 31 and 32 because we have more 28, 29 weaker and the window is until 32. So it will be like deviated. The population is deviated toward, toward this peak. And when you just consider, okay, let's say at the post menstrual age, yes, 31, 32, but correct, I mean, correct it to the gestational age. No, it's a trend. That's my. Uh, yeah, that's a good thought, but uh, we don't have a very solid evidence about the underlying. Uh, yeah, pathogenesis to for the egg to be developed at certain postnatal age, yeah. but there's assumption, like uh, or uh, scientific assumption that there is age when there is vascular changes that might happen, uh, especially in high risk infants exposed to like and oxygen, oxygen and yeah. the same as the same uh, changes happening at the retina that might have a few weeks after birth. Not necessarily to be corrected in 30 weeks or so. Yeah. Usually a few weeks. Not the same like ischemic. Ischemic uh, gut 
injury usually yeah. happens early, first yeah. 10 days. Exactly. But the typical neck usually happens later, a few weeks, not necessarily 30 weeks, but a few weeks, like a few weeks after but, two weeks. When yeah. you say typical neck, do we really know what typical neck is? Yeah, premature, I mean premature related. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, premature related gut injury. Mm. Like, like maybe to change. Now we're trying to move from neck to more and specific the description yeah. of the gut injury. Yeah. Yeah. Prematurity related gut injury, uh, food protein induced enterocolitis, which before we introduced uh, and saw the sound, we have been treating all of them, almost all of them as typical. Um, yeah. uh, <laughs> I mean, we, I, there were many years, like if you take 10 years ago, or even between 10 and 20 years ago, if you would ask me, but is, does cow's milk protein allergy exist in neonates? My answer would have been no, okay? Yeah. Because people didn't really think that neonates develop anything mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. related to allergy. Mm -hmm. And that thinking has changed. So if you go back in the, but the incidence of neck hasn't really dropped because people are still putting them all together because yeah, it's not yes. really neck. What they're including is not really neck. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. okay, let me like, uh, go to sorry, the slides. One question for me. Yeah. Well, what was the duration of MEF for the Three, Three days. days. Yeah. And anyway, like three days, five days, or even no MPF and subfort copying, <laughs> there is not any difference in literature, and that might increase or decrease risk. Okay, let us start, and we will make it interactive, like with discussion. Is not going to present? At the end, I think you will take I will, I will present one case, <coughs> one here, uh, with the starting point and the ending point. So, oh, like the a, this is a kind, kind of concept. Uh, against Yasser, because Yasser is saying the, the radiologist is uh, thinking about neck, and we are thinking it's not neck, it's the opposite. Now the radiologist was thinking not neck, but we were thinking neck. So, okay. yeah. so that will be at the end? Uh, I think so, when we finish, uh, okay. we can do it. So I will make it interactive. So I'll ask you a question, and that will probably answer some of the questions in the quiz. Okay. okay. So in, in this session is designed to highlight the new classification of gut injury. So now we are moving from neck, talking not talking about neck. So trying to get rid of this terminology over the next few years. Gut injury and the new integrated diagnostic approach relying on ultrasound, not 100% replacing X-ray, but the main modality. So ultrasound and, and pop and the X-ray might be considered just to achieve it, not the opposite, not X-rays. Uh, and the basic and other sounds of the <clears throat> So at, at the end of the presentation, you should be able to demonstrate the common triggers of that injury. We watch, we got all already through the module, demonstrate the clinical phenotypes of that injury, uh, and also demonstrate the algorithm, the diagnostic algorithm that we implemented here for a few weeks now. But we'll go over that in the discussion. So we have an effect now that uh, we can maybe have, I'll, just, uh, I'll ask you this question before I show you some slides. The fact that we have, we have been doing research for 30 years or more in like a very extensive research in, in the typical randomized trials or highly ranked research or the national trials like the Canadian, the Canadian Ocean trials or um, uh, the CAT trial, whatever, all of these trials, 30 years or more, and millions of dollars, or maybe hundred millions of dollars, is spent on research. And what we know now, what we know, we like that, what we know, just a very few answer of very, the most common questions that we need to get an answer for. Just a very few answers. And most of the work that we do in daily basis is not really based on very strong evidence. So can you tell me what are the uh, what we know is five commonly used interventions with bad outcomes and five common interventions with good outcomes? I think probably you know the answer. So give me five good five bad interventions first. So uh, five interventions with bad outcomes that we give, we do almost every day. Delayed enteral feeding. Yeah, very good. Okay. Or keeping him below. Yeah, no keeping him below. Um, aggressive feeding. Uh, aggressive feeding. So we, what's the definition of this feeding? We uh, start uh, early with feeding. 
and uh, we started formula. We, we our trend more to like, we are not really doing aggressive feeding to be honest anymore. Probably we are more lean towards the, to delay feeding or keeping the onset. But that's also good. Okay, I, sh I still locate using was the before was very common that we left because of the neck that I don't know if you consider No, no, the, the common intervention is not related to the prolonged mechanical yeah, ventilation. In general, not neck. Delaying extubation and prolonged yeah, mechanical Yeah, ventilation, mechanical ventilation. Yeah, what else? Uh, necessary antibiotic use. Antibiotics, yeah. definitely. Yes. Yeah. What else? So you mentioned now mechanical ventilation, mm -hmm. uh, delayed or uh, keeping MBO without a good reason. Antibiotics and the two more. I am like an unnecessary. I am not confused. Well, I don't know. Very good. Yeah, cardiovascular drugs are necessary. In the troops, it's very it's dangerous medication. And my, I have seen, but I know cases died because I use free troops. And the physician was hesitant to read the medication. One more. I have iron troops. Oxygen, very good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's... <laughs> so uh, now, yeah, so we have now the five was bad outcomes. What's the five was good outcomes that we know? Surfactant, caffeine, uh, caffeine, surfactant, antinatal steroids, antinatal steroids, very good. Breast milk, breast milk, breast milk, yeah, on top of that. CPAP, CPAP, very good. Thank you, Delayed Very good. So, and uh, oxygen therapy, mechanical ventilation, antibiotics, MPO, and the cardiovascular drugs. Good things. Test milk, the for the clarity, skin to skin, the one that you missed. C bad caffeine, maybe you won't together, and surfactant. So everything you can realize now, everything or almost most of the things that we do potentially harmful. The physician interventions potentially harmful. Uh, sorry, uh, in most of the situation harmful and potentially helpful. It's it's interesting if you look at the ones with the good outcomes. Uh, three of them are cheap. Mm. They don't cost any money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay. And you look at the ones on the left, the with bad outcomes. I mean, oxygen, mechanical. They, all these are very expensive. Yeah, need the intensive care. Need level three. <laughs> so probably everything from us potentially harmful. Everything gifted from God, nature, it's good. So milk, we don't like we are not creating milk. That's actually, yeah, naturally coming. And the the for the clamigo just returning back the fetal uh, blood, skin to skin, or just helping the babies to get the commensals and get bonding and a lot of other things. Like very, uh, like long list of benefits from uh, hand care of skin to skin. Okay, factor number two. Now, all of the bad outcome related interventions can be considered in any infant diagnosed with neck. So, the list I listed five, all of them will be considered, will intubate the baby and start maybe oxygen, cardiovascular support, antibiotics for sure, and then certain lines which might induce infection. And can you believe that when I, because I, yeah, now you know I'm like, uh, how many countries I, uh, uh, like I, um, I traveled through for the last few years. Some of the physicians all over the world, they said, telling me that they got x-ray report, infant was going home. They got x-ray for that for any different reason, and the x-ray reported as neck mm -hmm. by the radiologist, and they kept the baby in the hospital with antibiotics, MPO, and he's normal, ready to go home. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that's one of the extreme? That might happen because he got X ray reported, and how can I send the baby home with X ray reported as like what ha what happened if degenerated at home or anything? Any incident happened might not be related, but that's a bit of legal issue. I I have seen the opposite, yes, sir. Yeah. And the SPR, I clearly remember one guy from the South America. Yeah. He was claiming he had treated like thirty thousand kids of the babies, and uh, he didn't see even one one leg in, in the life. So it was ignoring there is a no neck, like a kind of uh, diagnosis. Like, yeah, <laughs> it was it was also like another extreme. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember that I, one of the units in, uh, in our one, our friends in Oman. He said that uh, this is very rare to see neck there. So there's two acceleration. Maybe that all of most of the babies they die before. Exactly. 
<laughs> so we didn't have pre premature babies that may be yeah. Yeah. or maybe uh, overdone, or maybe there is more like there's genetic predisposition that we have they don't have. Mm -hmm. That's true. What about the they all breastfeed in their mouth? Or maybe, uh, yeah, they have yeah. more. Okay. All breastfeed, which is, I assume that we, we do our maximum. <laughs> well, we don't, but that's really? another problem. Yeah, really? Okay. I mean, as a physician, as a team, but probably there is other issues that it should be solved. Yeah, we still don't know. I mean, how many times I, I don't get me started on breast milk. <laughs> <laughs> There's a different story, yeah, that it's a lot of like home or maybe quality project to solve this problem. Okay. So in Winnipeg, one of the centers that was high, like you mentioned about the last few years, we are almost at the middle, but we will I'll show you the image from um, San Boniface, which is different from HSC. San Boniface Hostel in 2013, uh, you can see the incidence of What's called neck at the time was very really high. Like we're talking about more than 30%. The average in the, in the most of the countries around seven, second digit, seven, eight percent. So it was very really high. Remember that it is basically related to radiological assessment. And, uh, and, and at some office, there is no pediatric trained radiologist as HSC. They are based on like other radiologists. Probably there is some differences in, in uh, reporting X rays. Uh, although they are doing their best, but that's our uh, responsibility to diagnose neck because neck is not the radiological diagnosis, it's a, it's a syndrome that's clinical, lab work, and everything. So, any x rays at the time reported as nematosis in pure seven days or at a minimum in antibiotics certain some time. So, that was the issue. We started out of some. Wait. So you have neck infants less than 26 weeks. Yes, right? I have to emphasize that what you showed in the slide is less than 29 weeks. That's right. Yes. We're talking now on very premature babies, yeah. uh, which is higher risk to less than 26 weeks. You can see the instance drops significantly at some point was even lower than the national average. And here the yellow is a national and the winner is HSC. So you can see the trends almost a little bit better compared to some others, but we have uh, almost higher than the average at some point, we started the ultrasound here. So it started to see lower trend. Again, as Molly said, that less than 29, 26 weeks is different from uh, the slide that you showed, which is including okay. everything, like all of the material. So that, the story <clears throat> that we started doing the ultrasound at the time, and that was very well respected by our colleagues from radiology very well respected and supported because we took the cases and we presented with Molly maybe more than one time to them. I presented maybe three times to the pediatric radiology department and they got really shocked and impressed about the number of x-rays that they reported and the ultrasound was normal and we continue treating for them. So what's the percent? Almost 50% of the x-rays that you see reported as nematosis or neck, they are not really, they are normal. 50%. I'm talking about X-rays reported as nematosis or neck, and it became very common to now see the X-ray reported, and we ignore the report and just rely on the clinical lab work plus ultrasound. And then we built out our experience, and we became the center of excellence of doing this work. Now I always remind everyone in the country when I meet our colleagues outside Winnipeg that. Remember that what we are doing here is different from other centers. We are live on neonatologist performing ultrasound. That's different from the radiologist. When the technician comes and he doesn't know if this infant is really sick or what the other consequence of the other lab or the interpretation might be biased, might see artifacts. But here we look at the ultrasound. The ultrasound does not match the clinical lab or we get the ultrasound again. And uh, if the ultrasound is normal, but the infant is sick, we we'll repeat it again. If the ultrasound is really, which is really rare, now most of the ultrasound is really reliable. And so the, for the last five years, we haven't seen any case deteriorated because misinterpretation of the ultrasound has never happened so far. That we never see that X-ray is normal, keep the baby, and the baby second day was decompromised. That's there's zero case reported for the last five years. 
Sometimes we, we repeat the ultrasound, same day or second day, because we're not sure of the artifacts and the air. And that's still acceptable. Keep MBO for one day is not a disaster until we get another uh, confirmatory ultrasound. Okay, and then the big success that the American Academy of Pediatrics, probably you have seen this article, they uh, in, invited me to write with them the point of care ultrasound guidelines, and that was uh, written in clinical report and uh, another report which is more detailed and technical report. And we are writing another one now for the Canadian uh, Pediatric Society as a policy statement with a Canadian perspective, more Canadian. Like, so it will be a little bit different from um, the American Academy guidelines. To my knowledge, this is the first American Academy guidelines was based on 100% Canadian experience. They usually, they are allowed their own experience in writing guidelines. But most of the algorithms written in the technical report, when you review it, you will see under the algorithm it's from Winnipeg Health Science Center, the Health Science Center in Winnipeg algorithm. So that was a big success for over five years of implementing the ultrasound. And I, when I made this table, a summary of potential point of ultrasound applications, here that's not ultrasound. And based on the literature that we reviewed, it's ultrasound is a more helpful and, uh, as a adjacent modality to abdominal X-ray. It's more helpful compared to X-ray, and which X-ray funding does not match clinical examination. And that was very really kind of gentle because I know that a lot of systems they don't have ultrasound. If I see that if I if I kill X-ray in the in my comment, we don't have any other option. That that option is not available everywhere. So I have like I, I have to be gentle a little bit in my description. And now in the the, uh, the technical report, we specified that all of the markers or most of the markers that we rely on with um, sensitivity specificity. And one of the issues that we may read in some of the literature that the, the um, uh, is this, uh, specificity of the ultrasound is high, but sensitivity is not that high. Why? Because they describe, they still, the, the, the concept is pneumatosis. Pneumatosis is not the best marker to see, or, or the only mar the marker that you rely on, because that might be interpreted sometimes by our tracks. In ultrasound, we have 12 markers. If you only detect in metosis and nothing else, that's most probably artifacts. We should see three, four markers. When I remind our colleague doing ultrasound, Hanifi and others, I need to tell you need to tell me three at least the three markers. If you see only nematosis, then that's most probably artifacts. I need to see different markers. And that's why we when we teach ultrasound, we teach all of the markers. So if we integrate these markers together, the sensitivity is close to like 95 or higher percent as sensitivity. Okay, the new classification of gut, of gut injury and neck, just to use neck also included, but it is gut injury. Gut injury is a spectrum. Mm -hmm. And the necrotizing trochoitis is that terminology should be only restricted to prematurity related gut injury. Mm -hmm. So I will be talking about the triggers. We already reviewed that in the module, but just I'll go quickly uh, over the triggers. And then the four clinical phenotypes, X-ray versus ultrasound, already uh, Molly, uh, already described that, and with uh, a very uh, very poor inter, inter uh, rate of uh, agreement for X-ray. And then the algorithm that we're using. So triggers, the first the trigger delayed feeding associated with gut injury. If you delay feeding, what happened? Delayed feeding or delay feeding plus antibiotics. Well, usually, when you delay feeding, you delay feeding it for a reason, and usually the infant is, in your opinion, could be sick, so you stop antibiotics. So this combination is very common. Delay feeding plus antibiotics. These are the worst combination that will damage the mucosa, and the mucosa is very, very tight junction, and the integrity is very good. And you can see now that very uh, helpful uh, bacteria, the green, is protecting against the path of potential pathogenic bacteria. In the gut. You will destroy that by food. no feeding, so, so the enzyme mycosa will get atrophied and then exposed to bacteria uh, bacteria because you killed the commensal bacteria by antibiotics. So that's since the mucosal atrophy and the change in the flora phenotype. So there's no flora anymore. And that usually happens again, as mentioned in 
and some resources with with a very not not very good evidence, 30 to 32 weeks uh, post uh, post uh, menstrual age. But you can realize now it is, and that's very important to keep in mind. So it starts not ischemic, so the the trigger is not ischemic in nature, but mm, almost all of the gut injury they are end up by ischemic injury. Like you will see either hyperemia, because hyperemia the blood is in the by late to compensate for the decrease in blood flow, that's hyperemia, or severe vasoconstriction because of endothelin 2, which is very strong vasoconstrictor to re re reduce the blood flow. That's why you may you may see me in some situation I recommend to give cardiovascular drugs to improve the perfusion if the skin is very bad, even if the blood pressure is not. Okay, so, so the just so cardiovascular drugs. Yeah. What what are you recommending? Like <laughs> nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is local nitric oxide, but uh, like I I nitric oxide, uh, uh, like how much will be circulated? I know, I know. It will not be that much, but usually I consider a really small dose. Uh, if the blood pressure is normal. And there's too much ischemia, so do be telling like low dose of the yes. yeah, like okay. three mics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if there is too much hyperemia and blood pressure, and this is also borderline or low, so more even if so as long as the blood pressure is normal, you would advocate potentially the dopamine. Yes, do be telling, and if there is evidence of significant ischemia. Yeah. That. And that is actually supported by not very strong evidence uh, from some physiologic articles, and some are like some. Like based on the case uh, uh, reports, they mentioned that the best combination is low dose of norepinephrine plus low dose of dobutamine. Probably without ultrasound, if you don't know if it's predominance of hyperemia or predominance of ischemia, probably you get both. But if I know exactly from ultrasound, I may select the, the best medication based on what I see in the ultrasound. Okay, so lymphocytosis. Associated with that injury that also has been described as in some violent cases. We have seen an in, in, uh, uh, increased number of cases in some of time, sometimes unexplained. Yeah, we have seen some cases when we had uh, like a big unit, not uh, several forms, when infant developed uh, gut injury or neck. A few days later, the <laughs> infant decided to this, like, close to the same infant. Develop the same symptoms that could be related to viruses. You may detect the high uh, increased trend of lymphocytosis in, the, in this situation. The uh, pathology is almost the same because of breach by flora at any time. That might happen at any time, there's no specific time. Again, stuff is not ischemic, but in this ischemic injury. And then, full protein used in enterocolitis, or what's called before chiomic protein allergy. This is the only type that is not really ischemic. That's why we continue feeding. There is no medication needed for this type. Uh, what you need to do is just change formula to a different uh, hypoallergenic formula, or ask mothers to stop uh, uh, if they is it possible. And you can see there's a, a recruitment of eosinophil around the mucosa here. So that's called eosinophilia associated with that injury. We should not really use neck in this situation. So eosinophilia associated. Uh, that injury. A typical ischemic one. So, typical ischemia could be ischemia, antenatal ischemia, like chronic type of ischemia in, in IUGR beds. Or um, you may see some of the reports from the antenatal ultrasound, ecogenic bowel. Ecogenic bowel usually associated with genetic issues or associated with IUGR. So, ecogenicity of the bowel might be related to transient ischemia. So, the one of the good things that you may Check in similar cases like our case, check the identity of the sound. Will that any report about the ecogenic bowel or not? Nothing? No. Okay. Or just, uh, that just about like a uh, small baby and the doctors. Yeah. About from the... So it is hypoxic ischemic, it could be hypoxic or could be ischemic. The other example, congenital cyanotic heart, which is typical hypoxemia. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is uh, or hypoxic ischemic and subtypically in high. In HIE, it is not common to see uh, gut injury in these cases. And uh, I remember that when I came to Winnipeg, we used to keep those babies MPO. 
like uh, during the cooling uh, or even before cooling for this if you need to keep them impure we used to do that so when i came to winnipeg during round uh, uh, i was suggested one of the hie cases plus of uh, when i suggested this hie on couldn't probably keep impure so she you replied to me that yes sir, we are not impure believers here do you remember that no <laughs> 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 so yeah, that was my, probably my was during my first month, and then I started to realize that we why we keep this in APO, and then over time, like I can't remember how many cases, probably not nothing with HIE, they had significant health injury or skimming, maybe one in ten years or so. That's not really common, but what's the common actually cases where I have seen congenital heart either. Uh, if the outfall tract obstruction, and I have seen also the other side of the car, even especially the surgery delayed, and then you started feeling there is no other option, you cannot keep the head for a long time. So, in these cases, are really high risk to develop ischemic gut injury. So, our what I call it hypoxic ischemic enterocolopathy that's described in one of the literature, and I used this terminology in one of my articles hypoxic ischemic enterocolopathy, so not neck. And that could be also related to uh, uh, cases with a very localized area with severe ischemia, which we call it spontaneous sandwich. We have common medication that can induce that. Can you remember some of them? Steroids, very good. Indomethacine. Indomethacine. Indomethacine, one of the most <laughs> of the strongest plasma structure to the valve, very bad medication to the valve. And we stopped using endosazine prophylaxis for um, IPH in our unit because of this issue. We had a lot of cases developed or developed uh, as not just okay. perforation. Um, the other, other medication that actually in just some literature, if you give high dose of caffeine early or you give the caffeine very fast. Okay. Yeah, but like the typical caffeine that we use is not really reported to be like a med medication or a medication associated with as well. So, I was one of the one of the in the Middle East, and then they reported a few cases unexplained uh, spontaneous sun operation, and they claimed that maybe the caffeine, but the way that uh, actually they use the caffeine, they inject the caffeine very fast in the delivery room. That could be the potential reason. So we advocate just to give it slower, over 20 or 30 minutes. We diluted too. And yeah. that should be diluted, exactly. Yeah. Diluted and given slower. So instead of just giving concentrated, as you, as you give, it's typically as we would give suppressor instead of just the uh, uh, like coffee. So it's very strong, and over short period of time that might be a really bad player. That's just assumption. Okay. So now the question that I need your answer: All types of gut injury are ischemic in nature. Yes. Yeah. Okay. What's the exception? The uh, food protein allergy. Food protein. Okay, very good. Yeah, I was going to ask a question. So why do you get? Why did you get pneumatosis and food protein allergy, and it doesn't progress? It's localized. Yeah, localized pneumatosis. And then, yeah. So, do you believe that we have seen cases of pneumatosis, and we have seen cases, probably one or two cases, for portal venous gas? Yeah. Not, yeah. And we continue feeding. Yeah, and the baby doesn't get sick. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Baby is not slightly sick because when there's ischemia, even local ischemia, the body will react to that. So it be a reaction from the body with, uh, uh, and this reaction might be uh, related like overall cardiovascular decompensation or non inflammatory uh, mediators that might induce vasoplegia and hypotension. And might cause apnea, might affect the central breathing center, center of soul. So there are a lot of consequences with what I'm going to ask But the infant with calvary protein allergy or uh, food protein using the colitis is this typical um, uh, inflammatory or allergic inflammation to the bowel, not ischemia. Why there is nematosis heaven? I don't know the answer. So it is like. Uh, Kind of injury to the mucosa, yeah. so the mucosa will will uh, breach of the mucosa or pro, uh, the mucosa will be broken, and that the air will find a way to to be in the wall. 
Yeah. But not the skin, not the skin. That's why the incomes were very really sick and very localized in some areas, not, not uh, generalized uh, methods like in typical uh, bad gut injury. Okay, so now we'll talk about the clinical phenotypes. These are the, in my opinion, because I highlighted that as opinion. Okay, so that's more as opinion. Clinical phenotypes of insulin injury. So yeah, necrotizing colitis that's specific to lower weight or pretty mature. If we if we would like to continue using using this technology, because we have been using technology for 30 years. So if I do feel not to use it. Yeah, all of a sudden that will that will be that will be tough for me. So it's maybe localize the terminology that might be easier. Keep it, but not just localize it to a certain category, which is premature infant. Compromised oxygen delivery. As you remember, oxygen delivery is three things. Remember, uh, so what are the three things for oxygen delivery? Uh, anemia. Yes, the hemoglobin. Cardiac yeah. output. Cardiac output, and one more. And oxygen. Oxygen saturation. Very good. So the three things making the oxygen delivery. <laughs> so if any one of them affected, that might induce the injury. So we have seen severe anemia. I, I saw in the bundle, it was uh, uh, yeah, that we seen the hemoglobin above 80. So keep the hemoglobin above 80. So in, in, the, in, in the systematic review, they did, did not actually describe a uh, direct relationship between transfusion itself and development severity, mm -hmm. but it's severity of the anemia when you transfuse on top of severe anemia. And the reason for that of the physiologic acceleration could be a reperfusion. So there will be a lot of mediators released to fossil dilate and keep everything dilated to compensate for the decreased oxygen delivery. And all of a sudden, they reperfuse the gut. So all of these things will be reversed. So you have significant change from fossil dilator nature to fossil constrictor. So that's a real diffusion injury. Can, can we just interject for a minute? So there's this trial going on, a wheat trial, okay, which they've been yeah. going on in the UK and they're trying to expand in Canada, and I think they're doing it in Halifax, keeping the baby NPO during, during the, the transfusion, the which makes no sense. Exactly. Anyway, it's not like it's, they are keeping the, the transfusion period three hours. I know. So if you uh, skip one feed, <laughs> okay, just if you feed the baby before transfusion and then transfuse and feed after that, it's still three hours. <laughs> you will not guarantee that the intestine but is empty don't... and there is nothing, no absorption, no digestion. That, that's what's exactly. going on. But there's still so. trying to recruit into that study. Yeah, I, which, which doesn't make sense. So, so. Because, like, you, I, I, again, you, you, you to guarantee that the gut's empty, you need to keep it empty. Oh, eight hours, <laughs> the twelve hours, something like, like eight this. to twelve hours. Yeah. Yes. But three hours just feeding before and after. So not feeding in between, which is very really easy that we are a transition over three hours. Unless you if you are feeding every two hours, then you just skip one feed. Which is not the end of the world. Yeah. So in style of obstruction, you remember the cell obstruction, we have two types, two common types. The cell obstruction can be a, 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 a very critical emergency type, which is valvulus or malnutrition, this twist of the uh, bus, uh, of the uh, blood supply of the gut that needs intervention within six hours. Otherwise, we'll lose that. Uh, or obstruction without compromised blood flow. Like what? Stricture. Yeah, adhesion, stricture, which is typical complications of. Uh, typical necrosine, premature infants. Mm -hmm. So in, in ultrasound, we predicted, we predicted that when you see too much uh, peritoneal fluids and significant global involvement of the gut, the likelihood of structure is really high, and we can predict that by ultrasound. Usually it happens about four weeks. When you, or you, or you start feeding, after some time you start feeding, you realize that the infant will uh, develop vomiting and there is no uh, tolerance to feeding. Then you confirm by contrast, or also you can we can use ultrasound. So you'll see dilated loops, and then proximal and distal constricted loops. That's a way that we diagnose uh, by ultrasound. And you see also reverse peristalsis. The peristalsis is moving in the reverse direction. And then food, and we have some cases, by the way, with negative contrast, like kind of past the contrast to the rectum. 
on the clinical obstruction and we confirm on my ultrasound. Because contrast is just a 5 to 10 ml, and the, the, the obstruction is not complete or partial, might pass uh, the, easily the, the uh, contrast. But if you give milk, that's a cumulative feeding. Give feeding after feeding will accumulate and then from the motor at the end. Okay. One, one thing that I've only seen one case of, uh, and I have to say, it crossed my mind about this baby, but I don't think it did, is it, um, uh, neonatal intersusception. You never, I mean, a lot of people say you never see it. I've no. seen one case. Dr. Bowman has seen one case. It's so, so it's so rare. Good. But presumably, and we have seen one case that HSC. Okay, so I, I okay, so that is something that would be easily picked up by. Officer. Yeah, and that case was picked up by ultrasound, but unfortunately, it was too late. The gut was almost gone, and it was very sick. And it was confirmed by autopsy. Okay. And I, but I still have the ultrasound uh, images for that case. Very bad intersusception. Infant two or three weeker. Stayed in the unit. Was almost ready to go home in level two. Corrected 42 weeks, like preparing to go home, and then developed into susception. Yeah. Whole protein induced in the colitis. Again, it's a type of gut injury, but treated in a different way. So, is there anything best as a phenotype, the cases that you see? And as I mentioned here, the compromise of delivery includes severe anemia, hypoxemia, shock, HIV. And although HI is not very common, and um, uh, probably the cooling and what we do for the case is more protective, not only for the brain, also for the gut. Um, and the metabolic acidosis and what like the lactic acidosis, these are protective things. We, we, we think that's a really, really bad thing, but these are from nature protective, protective to the organs for some time. So, so then if you're trying to fit in the microbiome into all this, yeah. uh, then the triggering factors would be hypoxic or ischemic insult, which then may lead to altering the microbiome. Yeah, if, I think everything here would be related to the yeah, microbiome. Yeah. Might, this might also the microbiome. Yes. Yeah, because this ischemia, you may give antibiotics, you stop feeding. Yeah, yeah. All of these things. And as I mentioned, acute focal ischemic stress to the inside of all. That's acute the, the, the SIP is under this category, in my opinion. Because yeah. that's acute stress, ischemic stress could be drug induced if you give bad steroids or give endomycin. And also, if you give both together, which you haven't done, if you give both medication together, the, the risk is really high. Okay, any question? About this slide, and and the the, the perforation and set is usually thick terminal island for the watershed area. Yeah, and it is usually in the watershed area, so yes. uh, ileocecal area yeah. or either flexure or yeah. uh, the semi core. Yeah, these are the most uh, uh, susceptible areas for uh, yeah. for skin. So when the uh, focal stress uh, skin is stress. Select part of select, make sure it okay. makes sense to select the one of the other areas. And for, by the way, for the sponges, sun perforation, if we have any case here with, this, uh, with perforation, doesn't mean that infant does not need to be reassessed by ultrasound. Because, and, uh, and I, I have interpreted one of the cases, one of the, one of the surgeon, he asked me the ultrasound would help because I either I may consider laparotomy if there is significant ischemia. Or just being rose green if there is no significant skin and just a, a selected area of of uh, and sun perforation. So one case at some boniface was infants atypical perforation, and when we checked everything, the, the other one was normal. Gut perfusion was good, reassuring apart from the perforation. So typically I reassured this typical just a small area of perforation, and this infant grieve or not, we really stopped the feeding and like seven to eight days after birth. Repeated the ultrasound, there is no any conviction of anything. Started MEF for three days and feeding after that. Went to relief. But infant with perforation might be associated with significant ischemia. The ultrasound will be helpful. After x ray will not let you know that. That's why you may remember my comment. Please, if you have said, go to all 
only rely on X-ray. You still have to, to do ultrasound. Correct, Hanif? And even that infant was assumed just sick. When you did ultrasound later, it was significant that I got injured. Okay, the case scenario that uh, like I selected one of the X rays, and this X ray was interpreted by the religious as nematosis, no doubt, no negotiation. That's typical nematosis. And when we asked one of our uh, colleagues, like really one of the senior colleagues, he said that I will consider it as nematosis. I have no doubt. So that's why I selected this X ray as an example. I, we had so many X rays reported as. Uh, nematosis by radiologists, but kind of maybe um, you may argue that like a typical nematosis or not, but this is one of them. One of them. This 30 weaker infant at two weeks of age passed multiple frank blood verdictum, and you have this x ray which is reported. And your neonatologist said that I agree, this is nematosis. You have CRV6 twice and a remarkable CDC under blood gases. So, would you keep him pure or not? I would examine, is there any in a fissure? The good student and the bad student. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but without ultrasound, what would you do, uh, Assume that before the ultrasound era. I'd certainly have worked the baby up for neck and kept the baby in pure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, how long? I, I don't know. Okay. But the typical, um, I think, before the you the baby's well, I mean, you're right. I mean, okay, we used to keep babies NPO for 14 days. Yes. Then Joseph Noy in 2011 said 10 days is probably okay. Mm. Um, so I, I probably would have kept this baby NPO for at least 72 hours. Mm. Okay, yeah. Okay, but all the other colleagues will be typically on ten days. Yeah, as... so I said at least. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, that was a decision from the team at the time. Like yeah, seven days and they started antibiotics and central line. <laughs> okay, continue. And then one day later, we did the other sound. And uh, at the time, one of our uh, retired colleagues, I told him, like he asked me about the other sound. I told him if I would like to use uh, ultrasound as a model to teach how the normal ultrasound looks like, I will select this study. I have no doubt this ultrasound is normal. So very good is here, very good perfusion. You can see the movement in the from far. Mm -hmm. And this left our quadrant, the most uh, like uh, uh, significant area of suspicion here, the left of our quadrant. But everything else was the same. Pretty good perfusion, prostatosis, and when you see nematosis, even if you suspect there's maybe some suspicion here, like the area around it should not be seen with prostatosis or good perfusion. When you see nematosis, the bowel should be sick, no prostatosis and no good perfusion. That's why nematosis only in ultrasound. And if you came to me and said, "Yeah, you can see only nematosis in ultrasound," I, without even reviewing the ultrasound, I would say, "You, sorry, you are." Yeah, that, that's wrong. I don't believe you. If you told me, I don't believe, or I don't believe this case of neck. Okay? But if you tell me that I, I saw absent, uh, uh, is, uh, absent stances, mm -hmm. some retinal fluids, mm -hmm. there is no good in uh, signature, the thickening of the bowel, now I can believe you. I will come and review the case with you. But okay. if, you, if you tell me that there are only nematoses, no. That's one of the uh, powerful features of ultrasound because we have so many markers that we can integrate all together. And that's why in the literature, when they convert the nematosis in ultrasound and the X-ray, they are almost comparable because they only they only evaluated nematosis in separate, not in the integration of other markers. So you have to be really careful when you review the literature talking about ultrasound. Although most of the literature comment that ultrasound is severe, so we say, but it is more severe than what, what's described. And, and one very eminent neonatologist assured me that he, he believed that um, 
necrotizing enterocolitis is overdiagnosed by the use of ultrasound. Yeah. Which, and it's because they don't look at all the marker. Exactly. And that's also reported by the medical team. Yeah. They may see some suspicion of the same, like x ray. They use the, the description of hematosis the same as they describe in x ray. So any suspicion of hematosis may be safer than suspicion of hematosis. So that's all maybe over diagnosis. I agree. But what I showed you that the rate, the incense already decreased, not increased. So it is related to who is doing the ultrasound and how we the team interpret the ultrasound. Okay, so this infant will start feeding and was related very well. Another, uh, so we are using what's called the best classification. The or the modified one, according to what we have seen and reported in the X-ray, this this is consistent with the stage two A. Yeah. Correct. So it makes sense, as Moni said, that I will keep NPO at least for seventy two hours. As Moni probably all others will use seven days NPO because that's stage two A. That's the classification that we had before. That's before the ultrasound here. But after we apply the ultrasound, it is out of the classification. It means that the classification is really poor. Another case scenario B, 26 weeks, hemodynamically stable, at two weeks of age, developed pancytopenia and high CRP. That could be sepsis, correct? Mm -hmm. And CRP was one up to like close to 200 and rising, no lactic acidosis. And you have this x ray here. And this X-ray was reported as non-specific dilated bowel. That's that's it. Non-specific dilated bowel. Dilated loops. Okay. There are some dilated loops here. Yeah. But would you consider this X-ray as neck? Are you why? Yeah. Would you consider it as neck hyphen? Looks like a septicalis. Yeah, you can't consider it as septicalis. In, in X-ray, the markers that uh, Markers that, that have been reported at one of the three. Dilated loops is not one of them. Hematosis, portal venous gas, and uh, perforation. Nothing yeah. else. And fixed loop, no more fixed loop. Yeah. This I uh, just saw yeah. the description. But the typical, the typical uh, ones. Excuse me, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I think you're disconnected from the Duke. Really? Yes. Uh, we have Rebecca. Yeah, there you go. Oh. So what? It's there. Maybe the duration. Of I mean, that was no, we are there. That was the. Uh, I think that was the old. Uh, that was the previous. Uh, no it's it's there, there actually. Yeah, I send you the email. So the link that you. Okay. But Nico on. Yeah, it was the link that. But Nico on. Yeah. So, yes. Everything's working. No, that was the previous link. We have the, we, we said we said oh uh, maybe she joined the non-invasive another link actually yes, we'll yes. continue with the same one oh i see that's why yeah oh, we have to join the new one because that was the oh 